Hello, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are in our world. This is Audrey Trushke. I'm Associate Professor of South Asian History at Rutgers University in Newark, New Jersey, in the United States. And I am delighted to be joining you from, uh, from my lockdown here in New Jersey. Wherever you are, most likely you are also in lockdown, right? In India, in Europe, and elsewhere. And I begin with that because it's, it's a reminder that history is always told in the present day. Now, in a sense, that's a sort of bland truism, right? Of course, history is told in the present day, but it also means that certain things about the past can become more visible and more vibrant and vivid for people at certain points in time, depending on what's going on in our present, right? That's part of why it's important to continue studying history because our perspectives on it do change a bit over time. I'm going to circle back to this, given our present worldwide circumstances of pandemic and lockdown, a couple of times in the course of my talk today. So what we're going to do is I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes. I'm going to tell you about Aurangzeb Alamgir. I'm going to tell you about two Aurangzebs, actually, the myth and the man. And then at the, at the end, once I'm sort of done talking, uh, we will sort of switch to a different Facebook Live session and I will be happy to take questions. All right. So I am just going to jump right in. Aurangzeb Alamgir was the sixth ruler of the Mughal Empire. He ruled over what was probably the largest geographical empire of his time. He was the richest man alive in the last half of the 17th century. He has also been dead for more than 300 years. The empire over which he ruled, vast and impressive though it was, was wiped from the face of this earth more than six generations ago. So Aurangzeb and the Mughals are long gone in terms of territory and reality. But to hear how everyday people vilify and excoriate Aurangzeb, it would be a mistake to think of him as entirely gone. Rather, Aurangzeb is undeniably alive in popular imagination. Now, a big moment came in 2015 when Aurangzeb's road was stripped, or sorry, Aurangzeb's name was stripped from a major road in Delhi. You can see an image here of Delhi city officials who crept out literally in the dead of night and chiseled Aurangzeb's name off the road signs. What was Aurangzeb Road was renamed as APJ Abdul Kalam Road, named after India's 11th president, and as many saw it, a more acceptable Indian Muslim than Aurangzeb. And that is really what this road change was about. It was about a Hindu majority claiming the right to adjudicate what it meant to be an acceptable Indian Muslim. If you can believe it, Aurangzeb's reputation has worsened since 2015. Aurangzeb's name is used as an insult, as accusations of Aurangzeb Raj and being more cruel than Aurangzeb are lobbed back and forth between political parties. The BJP is hot and heavy into this stuff, but Congress uses this language as well. You can see in the corner here an image of Prime Minister Modi dressed up to look suspiciously like Aurangzeb. Now, I think Modi looks kind of nice in this image, but I don't think that the intention was to be flattering to him. In the world of education as well, Aurangzeb has had a hard go of things as of late. He has been erased or crudely caricatured along with other Mughals in school textbooks in parts of India. Depending on who is in power in different Indian states, some of those uh, changes have been reversed and some have not, some have accelerated. These days, even thinking about Aurangzeb can be considered a suspicious activity by the Indian state. Now, all of this hatred of Aurangzeb, this isn't based on the real historical king. Okay, this is all based on the mythical Aurangzeb, who lives in modern imaginations and gets worse every year. So let me tell you about Aurangzeb the myth. The mythical Aurangzeb is envisioned as a proto-ISIS, anti-Hindu genocidal maniac, okay, the Osama bin Laden of his day. You'll note here the title change in this play on the cover of my Aurangzeb book in its Indian edition. Aurangzeb the myth, he was a temple-destroying zealot. He never passed a Hindu temple without ordering it brought down immediately. 
right? It was just basically a, a river of blood following him everywhere. Now, in that, my description, you, you can hear that a lot about this mythical Aurangzeb, this plays on modern Islamophobia, okay, hatred of Muslims, which is particularly virulent and violent in India at the moment. Now, given that Aurangzeb, even in his mythical imagination, is so controversial, maybe we just shouldn't talk about him. I came across this piece of sage advice on Facebook a couple of years ago from the delightfully irreverent Mad Mughal memes. Shout out to them here. All right, how to survive holiday parties in just three steps. This was posted in November, I think. Don't mention Aurangzeb. Don't mention Aurangzeb. Right? It's like the rules of Fight Club. You don't talk about Fight Club. That's the first rule. The second rule, you don't talk about Fight Club. Now, maybe, maybe I should have followed this advice, but I didn't follow it. And in fact, I wrote an entire book about Aurangzeb Alamgir. So I walked into a minefield, and I knew that when I decided to publish a historical biography on Aurangzeb. The book exists in three different editions, three different covers, and you can see them here. We have the Stanford University Press edition, that's the North American slash worldwide edition. There's the Penguin India edition available in India, and there's the Oxford University Press Karachi edition available in Pakistan. These three editions, other than the, the, the cover, are nearly identical, although they are not entirely identical. And I will return to the differences between them because some of those are important when I talk about the book's varying receptions a bit later today. But first, let me tell you about my scholarship and about the real Aurangzeb, okay? Because I'm a historian and as much as I care about the present and I live in the present and I have to deal with the mythical Aurangzeb because he is all around us, what I really care about is the real actual historical guy who ruled the Mughal Empire 300, 350 years ago. Now in the book, my goal is a sort of relatively straightforward one. I want to explain a complicated king and his actions in causal historical terms, right? I want to get back at the 17th century figure. I want to understand what he did and why he did it. Okay, for those of you who are familiar with the work of historians, this is pretty standard stuff, right? This is the bread and butter of what we do. But my arguments have surprised many. My core argument in the book, if I can put it in a sentence, it's this. Aurangzeb is best understood as a pre-modern Indian king pursuing several ideals, including raw power, a vision of Mughal kingship, piety, and above all, his own particular vision of justice. Now, Aurangzeb had three full brothers. Okay, and as far as I know, we don't actually have an image that shows the four of them sort of all together, but we do have this image that at least shows three of them. They were full-blooded brothers, right, because Shah Jahan had, had a sort of favorite wife, and they all had equal claim to the throne. Okay, there was no primogenitor in the Mughal Empire. There was no assumption that the eldest son would inherit the throne. All male, all male children had, had equal claim. And so the brothers, locked in competition from the moment of their birth, spent their princely years trying to become the one most likely to ascend the Mughal throne. That meant building networks with new groups who could be integrated into the Mughal Empire, learning administrative skills, figuring out how to run a battlefield, right? They were preparing to be the most capable prince and thus become the next Mughal emperor. For Aurangzeb, this meant spending his princely years largely on the road and not at home. Okay, he went back to Delhi pretty infrequently in the 20 plus years of, of his adult princely life. So to put that in very 2020 terms, being on lock, not being on lockdown was pretty key to Aurangzeb's success against his brothers. Everyone knew that Aurangzeb and his three brothers would one day fight for the Mughal throne. The only questions were when the struggle would happen and who would prevail. Now, in the War of Succession, which was notably long, lasted nearly two years, and was notably bloody, right, Aurangzeb eventually prevails. Okay, we all know that. He was about 40 years old when it started, right, late 30s, and then went into his early 40s before the sort of dust settled. 
He killed two of his brothers during or shortly after the succession struggle. He would have killed the third brother, Shah Shuja, if he could have gotten his hands on him. Okay, Shah Shuja only lived because he escaped to Burma before Aurangzeb's men could grasp him. I want to underscore that this was entirely normal. Aurangzeb's father, Shah Jahan, had murdered some of his brothers and other male relatives just to like be super safe and so forth going back through the Mughal line. If I have anyone listening who thinks that Dara Shako would have done any different, you are sadly mistaken. Okay, we have pretty solid evidence uh, that Dara actually tried to kill his brothers even before the War of Succession. There's no doubt he would have acted as ruthlessly as Aurangzeb if he had prevailed. Now, the idea behind this bloodbath was that the most capable prince would rise to become king, right? Why go with the guy who just happened to be born first when you have, in this case, four brothers to choose from and you can sort of let, let the best one rise to the top? And indeed, Munis Faruqi, a historian at Berkeley, has written about how princely succession struggles actually enlivened the Mughal state rather than harmed it. So Aurangzeb crowned himself in 1658 for the first time. Okay, and it was a small ceremony, right? This is an image possibly of it here, right? There's only a couple of people. They're almost social distancing compliant. The reason why this ceremony was sort of small and, and sort of tamped down, it wasn't very elaborate, was because Aurangzeb was still in the midst of the War of Succession. So he crowned himself king again in 1659 with a more elaborate ceremony, all right? And that one was a true mela. Fireworks lit up the sky. Uh, one of the historians of the period says that the cloth merchants made out like bandits. Aurangzeb bought so much cloth, right? Everybody celebrated. Aurangzeb then quickly began to rule. He ruled as an Indian king, as a Mughal king, and above all, in his own eyes, as a just king. Now, justice, or adal, strikes many people as a very odd concept to discuss regarding India's most hated pre-modern Muslim king. But Aurangzeb was absolutely obsessed with justice. This comes out in his own writings, in histories of the period, and in his actions as emperor. Let me give you a few pieces of evidence. This is one. Once Aurangzeb's father, Shah Jahan, after he had been deposed, and I will return to Shah Jahan being deposed. He criticized his newly crowned son for ineffectively deploying troops. This is how Aurangzeb responded to his father's critique. I wish you to recollect that the greatest conquerors are not always the greatest kings. The nations of the earth have often been subjugated by mere uncivilized barbarians, and the most extensive conquests have in a few short years crumbled to pieces. He is the truly great king who makes it the chief business of his life to govern his subjects with equity. In other words, being a fair ethical ruler ranked above controlling territory. This is a very surprising hierarchy to find embraced by the head of an expansionist state. Another piece of evidence for Aurangzeb's investment in justice comes from the Italian traveler Nicolai Manucci who was no Aurangzeb enthusiast, okay? He was generally very critical of him. Even he said about the king, he was of a melancholy temperament, always busy at something or other, wishing to execute justice and arrive at appropriate decisions. The last piece of evidence I'll give you on the Aurangzeb's investment in justice is this. Ishvara Dasa, an astrologer, wrote about Aurangzeb in Sanskrit in 1663. He called the king righteous, dharmya, and he even said that his tax policies were lawful, vidhivat. In short, people of all religious stripes and backgrounds agreed that Aurangzeb prioritized justice in his ruling strategy. So then we come to the question, well, what was Aurangzeb's justice? Aurangzeb's vision of justice was not how we define justice today. Okay, this Aurangzeb was a pre modern emperor. He ruled a pre modern empire. Okay, there's no citizens, there's no nation state, there's no concept of individual liberties, of civil rights, of gender equality, of equality of all peoples. Okay, we're way before all of that in Indian history. So Aurangzeb had a very different vision of justice, right? It's not what I would call justice, it's hopefully not what any of you would call justice either. 
So what we want to know is what was justice for Aurangzeb? What were the contours of that and how did it shape Mughal state policy? Let me give you a few examples of actions that Aurangzeb undertook during his reign that sort of demonstrate the, the contours of his vision of justice. These also happen to touch upon some of the more controversial aspects of his rule. So let me begin with his twinned policies, and they were very much twinned of temple protection and temple destruction. Hindu and Jain temples dotted the landscape of the Mughal kingdom. Aurangzeb's notion of justice included something roughly approximating freedom of religious practice, and so religious institutions were generally entitled to Mughal state protection. For example, in February of 1659, right, Aurangzeb is, is a brand new emperor at this point. Right? This is one of his early acts. He wrote to local Mughal officials at Benares and among other things said, several people have out of spite and rancor harassed the Hindu residents of Banaras in nearby places, including a group of Brahmins who are in charge of ancient temples there. The king then ordered his Mughal officials, quote, you must see that nobody unlawfully disturbs the Brahmins or other Hindus of that region so that they might remain in their traditional place and pray for the continuance of the empire. Aurangzeb issued dozens of similar orders throughout his reign. I've given you just a smattering of them here. These orders did things like shield temples from unwanted interference. They granted land to Hindu communities and they provided stipends to Brahmins. As a result of Aurangzeb's default policy of protecting Hindu and Jain temples, most but not all temples still stood at the end of his reign. So how many temples were destroyed during Aurangzeb Alamgir's reign? We will never have an exact number. Anybody who tells you that they have an exact number is not a historian. Richard Eaton is the leading authority on this particular subject. He puts the number of confirmed temple destructions during Aurangzeb's rule at just over a dozen, with fewer tied to the emperor's direct commands. I raise that number to about 15, and I do that by adding in a couple of orders that Eaton either missed or discounted. These include against the Somanath Temple and Ahmedabad's Chintaman Temple. We, of course, still fall short of the wild estimates of 10,000 or even 60,000 that one hears thrown about in charged political context. And I do sometimes get sent, you know, meme things, pictures like this, and I get asked, you know, is there, is there anything behind this, right? Is there any history, any kernel of anything? And the short answer is no, right? We're looking at between 12 and 15 confirmed temple destructions during Aurangzeb's rule. Now, I can, I can only give you approximate numbers, right? I, I will never be able to give you an exact number, okay, of the number of temples destroyed, but I can... I stand on much firmer historical ground, let's say, in telling you why. Why did Aurangzeb destroy this temple and not that temple? Why did he target a small number of temples? And this answer gets us back to his vision of justice. So a good example is Benares' Vishwanatha temple, which was demolished in 1669. Now, the Vishwanatha temple had been built during Akbar's reign, Aurangzeb's great-grandfather, by Raja Man Singh whose great-grandson, then Jai Singh, many believed had helped Shivaji escape from Aurangzeb's court in 1666. Aurangzeb really did not appreciate Shivaji escaping. Okay, that was a disaster for, for Mughal uh, strategy, right? It was a major pain for Aurangzeb for the rest, of his, the rest of Shivaji's life, all right? Additionally, in addition to that major issue, in 1669, a rebellion broke out among Banaras landlords, some of whom were connected to the Vishwanatha temple. So we have two political reasons why this particular temple was likely brought down. Now, a mosque was erected on the former site of Benares' Vishwanatha temple. We don't actually know who built that mosque or why. Okay, many people assume that Aurangzeb did it, but I've never found evidence of that. When you look at this image, and I'm showing you the image for a particular reason, it's very striking, right? It's visually striking because the current mosque incorporates the one of the walls of the old temple. 
And I want to recognize and name here that it is hard to look at an image like this and to not see it through modern eyes, right? I think many of us look at this and we see Hindu-Muslim conflict. We see religious offense. By naming and recognizing the utter modernity of those frameworks, of those perspectives, I think that that's the sort of first key step in how we get over them. Right? We work through our 21st century problems and assumptions in order to strip them away so that we can get back to the 17th century political reasons behind this temple destruction. Now, while I think that Benares is Vishwanatha temple and other temples were brought down primarily for political reasons, I think that in the case of the Vishwanatha temple, there may have also been some religious reasons behind its destruction, but not the ones that everyone thinks of. Right? Everyone thinks that Aurangzeb was just this mad anti-Hindu bigot. But I don't think that was it at all. I think, rather, in 1669, Aurangzeb learned, and I quote, this is from one of the historians of the period, in Tatta Multan, and especially at Banaras, deviant Brahmins were teaching false books at their established schools. Curious seekers, Hindu and Muslim alike, traveled great distances to gain depraved knowledge from them. So Aurangzeb perhaps wanted to curb this false teaching, right? And that's his view that the, these Brahmins were misleading Hindus and Muslims both. And this makes sense within the wider Mughal framework of a very paternalistic approach to being a king, which is a key part of Aurangzeb's justice. Now Aurangzeb didn't come up with this stuff, all right? This is sort of quintessentially Mughal. For example, Akbar, took to task errant Brahmins, who in his eyes also took advantage of the less sophisticated. For Akbar specifically, he said that Brahmins misrepresented Hindu texts to lower castes. This was part of why Akbar wanted to translate Sanskrit texts into Persian to make them more widely available. Akbar hoped that doing this would prompt these, quote, arrogant Brahmins, and that those are Akbar's words, to reform their ways. So 100 years later, his great-grandson Aurangzeb similarly evinces concern with elite Brahmins deceiving common Hindus about their own religion. Aurangzeb was perhaps especially alarmed that Muslims were also falling prey to people he viewed as charlatans. Aurangzeb intervened paternalistically in other areas of his subjects' religious lives as well, to varying degrees of success. He curbed <clears throat> Excuse me. He curbed overly zealous public celebrations of both Hindu and Muslim religious festivals, including Holi and Eid. He tried to ban alcohol, prostitution, and opium. He was wildly unsuccessful in all three of those endeavors. The key point here for me is that Aurangzeb thought that guiding his subjects in proper religious practice within either Hinduism or Islam, that this was a component of being a just king. Note, however, that there was no religious litmus test for state service, okay? Overall, Aurangzeb did not consider religious differences important for who could serve the Mughal Empire. For example, in the 1680s, a Sunni guy recommended to Aurangzeb that he throw Shias out of the Mughal nobility. And Aurangzeb said, no, absolutely not. Aurangzeb also increased Hindu participation in the Mughal nobility by nearly 50%. Now that is as compared to Shah Jahan, Jahangir, and Akbar. Remember that the next time someone tells you that Akbar was so great and tolerant and loved Hindus and Aurangzeb was the polar opposite, that a greater percentage of Mughal nobles were Hindu under Aurangzeb as compared to Akbar. Now, I want to be clear that Aurangzeb did not increase Hindu participation in the nobility because he, you know, loved Hindus or wanted to, like, help them out, okay? He did it for political reasons, uh, particularly the inclusion of Maratha, former Maratha lands, as he expanded his empire south. But the point is that their religion was not an issue, okay? Aurangzeb's justice had its limits, and these limits tell us a great deal about this king. And, and sort of what he was all about. An early example concerned his father, Shah Jahan. So Shah Jahan fell ill in 1657, okay, after nearly 30 years on the throne. 
Now, Shah Jahan was very ill. Uh, he seemed to be at death's door. And so his four adult sons mobilized for the war of succession that they had spent their lives preparing for. They honestly believed that dad was going to die. Okay, but dad didn't die. Shah Jahan recovered uh, quite inconveniently for everyone, except for him. This meant that, you know, after the War of Succession was sort of wrapped up, Aurangzeb faced the unfortunate reality for him that he had not only conquered his and beat his brothers, which was more or less fine with everyone, but that he had unseated the ruling Mughal king, which was decidedly not fine with everyone. The biggest problem here, as I see it, was that everybody in the Mughal Empire, including Aurangzeb, thought that overthrowing his father was against Sharia that it went against Islamic law. All right, think of this as like a dad problem on a mega scale. So Aurangzeb, he didn't put his father back on the throne, right? He could have done that, but he didn't do it. Instead, he ruled for seven years while he kept his father locked away in Agra's fort, right? So for all of us who are sort of struggling with, you know, a couple of weeks or a couple of months of lockdown, you know, th think about poor Shah Jahan, all right? During this period of time, while Shah Jahan still lived, but Aurangzeb was king, officials in Mecca refused to accept Aurangzeb's gifts. They said he was not the legitimate ruler of Hindustan. Contemporary rulers, such as the Safavid king, sharply criticized the treatment of Shah Jahan. The Safavid ruler at the time wrote to Aurangzeb and sort of taunted him. He said, you claim to be Alamgir, the world Caesar, Aurangzeb's regnal name, but really you're just paid out of gear. You've just seized your dad. Shah Jahan's chief Qazi, the religious guide of the entire Mughal Empire, flat out refused to sanction Aurangzeb's ascension to the throne. Aurangzeb fired the guy and appointed a more amenable Qazi in his place. Now, Aurangzeb sometimes tried to lie about having imprisoned his father, and nobody ever bought those lies. But he never even really attempted to justify it. And that's because he could not. It was unjustifiable. This was a case where the thirst for raw power conflicted with Aurangzeb's ideals of both justice and Islam. He chose power. Now, speaking of piety and Islam, a lot of people want to know, did it motivate Aurangzeb? Right? Was he, was he really the most pious of the Mughal kings? How did this influence his ruling strategy? Well, to answer those questions, especially how it sort of, you know, shaped how he was as emperor, we first have to know a little bit more about Aurangzeb's vision of Islam, about his version of what it meant to be Muslim. Now, I cannot get inside Aurangzeb's head or know his heart. Okay, he's been dead for a long time. But I can tell you this, Aurangzeb's actions suggest piety. He actually prayed periodically. Okay, I don't know if he prayed five times a day. You know, he was a busy guy, but he actually did pray periodically throughout his life, which not all the Mughal kings did. He never drank alcohol, which reflects his piety. Also a wise decision since he came from a family of alcoholics. He memorized the Quran and became a Hafez in his 40s after ascending the throne. But his vision of Islam was not orthodox. He really was a Sufi through and through. You can see an image of him here visiting Muinuddin Chishti's shrine in Ajmer. He was also talismanic. There's a story that one time when he was camping on campaign, on a military campaign, there were flood waters that threatened the encampment. And so what he did was he wrote Quranic verses on pieces of paper and threw them into the flood waters. And the story goes that it then made them subside. Now, in stories like that, we can see how Aurangzeb used Islam politically. Okay, maybe he really believed it in his heart of hearts. I don't really know, but he also performed it politically. But crucial is to know is this, that Aurangzeb dispensed with Islam and with piety when it proved a hindrance to power. I think one of the best examples of this, it's, and it's an example of the limits of his justice and the expendability of Sharia for him, it has to do with the siege of Bijapur. So in 1685, Aurangzeb besieged Bijapur, an independent Muslim-led kingdom in southern India. The siege was brutal, as sieges tend to be. The Mughal army trapped around 30,000 Bijapuri soldiers within the city walls and then starved them of food, water, and medicine for more than a year. 
At one point during this conflict, when the death toll was soaring, a delegation of Bijapuri theologians asked Aurangzeb to halt the deadly siege on the grounds that warring against fellow Muslims was unjust. Now, the theologians, the ulama, they were correct. Okay, as everybody involved in this conflict understood Sharia, it did go against Sharia. But Aurangzeb said no, right? Flat no, I will not halt the siege. The siege ended when Sikandar Adil Shah surrendered unconditionally and bowed low in the dust at Aurangzeb's feet. His entire, he handed over his entire kingdom to the Mughal emperor. Aurangzeb always chose power, even when it was relatively worthless power. As Bhim Sain, a Kayist who served Aurangzeb in the Deccan Wars, put the emperor's insatiable thirst for land. Quote, I found the men of the world very greedy, so much so that an emperor like Aurangzeb Alamgir, who wants for nothing, has been seized with such a longing and passion of taking forts that he personally runs about, panting for some heaps of stone. Aurangzeb died, warring in the Deccan and in southern India in 1707. His strategy at the end of his life, really the last 20 years, was dubious at best. But the thirst for land, that was something continuous with the Mughal kings since Babur, his great-great-great-grandfather. There were other continuities that lasted to the very end between Aurangzeb and earlier Mughal emperors. So, for example... The Ramayana was first translated into Persian by Akbar in the 1580s. Akbar sort of liked to fancy himself as similar to Lord Ram. Thereafter, people kept retranslating the Ramayana into Persian. They kept writing new Persian Ramayanas, and very often they dedicated them to the reigning Mughal king. In 1705, right, at the very end of Aurangzeb's reign, another Persian Ramayana was written, and the guy dedicated it to Aurangzeb. One thing that that tells us is that even in his final years, Aurangzeb had not changed Mughal kingship sufficiently to break the perceived link between the Mughal sovereign and the Ramayana. There were other points of continuity as well. Aurangzeb kept Hindu astrologers on his staff. This is something that had been done since Akbar. Aurangzeb also spent his final years in the company of a Hindu woman who was a musician. We think a lot these days about Aurangzeb the conqueror, but we think so much less often about Aurangzeb the lover. Aurangzeb died in the Deccan in 1707, and as per his wishes, he was buried in a simple open-air grave at a Chishti shrine. His grave as it exists today, it's pretty simple, but it was even simpler during his day, and right? all this marble and stuff was added later. But do remember Aurangzeb's final resting place the next time someone tells you that he was an Orthodox Muslim, right? He is still at a Sufi shrine. Despite such a humble burial, the king could not escape his earthly achievements nor his tangled legacy. And Aurangzeb has been making waves ever since. Now, my book, Making These Arguments and More, came out in 2017. You can see the three editions of it here. Uh, the book has also been translated. I think we we have translations in three languages now, Hindi, Bengali, and Urdu. Uh, and I don't think I have a, an image of the Hindi cover, uh, and that, that's because of lockdown, because of shipping and, and so on and so forth. But I'm told that there is actually a Hindi edition available. Now, that said, we've, we've had some problems with, with the Aurangzeb book, and the problems actually started before it was published. In its Indian edition, my Aurangzeb book is lightly censored, okay? And this was self-censorship. I did this acting on legal advice, okay? India has laws that restrict freedom of speech. You have a great many laws that restrict freedom of speech in India, actually. And, you know, in, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen some of those more draconian, old-school British-era laws, uh, you know, sort of lobbed against... Um, well, you know, uh, various members of the press and, and publications and individuals, but they are used against historians and authors as well. Now, the largest alterations that I made to the Aurangzeb book in its Indian edition were to a chapter on Shivaji. Okay, if there is one figure more controversial than Aurangzeb, it is Shivaji. Okay, I actually took out some historical information there. 
I also had to remove a map, this map. Okay, the, the BJP is very sensitive about, about maps right now. Okay. Now, the, the amount that was changed in, in the, my Orange Zed book in India, um, it's, it's, not, it, it's not a lot, right? It's not substantial. We're talking about a few sentences, not, you know, chapters or anything. But if this is done to every history book, right, it adds up over time. And the bottom line is this. The Indian public doesn't have access to their full history. Right? So if you read my book and it's Indian edition, you didn't read everything that I wrote because your government and your laws would not allow me to make it available to you. And that is a big problem, right? If it makes you angry, I think it should. Now that said, even a lightly censored Aurangzeb proved too much for many readers. These quotes you see are all from published reviews of the book. Okay, they accuse me of whitewashing Aurangzeb of atrocity denial, right? That's a very serious accusation rooted in discourse about the Holocaust. And they even accuse me of white splaining Aurangzeb, right? Playing on the politics of my identity. Now, note that none of these are attacks on my actual scholarship. Okay, the, the scholarly reviews of my Aurangzeb book have been quite positive. These attacks are all about the politics of history and the politics of identity, specifically my identity. The attacks become significantly less civilized when we turn to social media, okay? I'm not going to share many specific examples of the Twitter filth that I've received in connection with my Aurangzeb book. And that's because it's, it's sort of instantly tiring to look at and it's also highly repetitive. But just take my word for it that I'm subjected to a pretty consistent barrage of sexism, misogyny, and extreme bigotry that is both racially and religiously charged. Now, as far as I can tell, much of this hate appears to come from India, but it also comes from New Jersey, where I live, where I work, and where the Hindu right is notably strong. The hate mail, the hate tweets were pretty hot and heavy for about a year and a half after I published Aurangzeb. It's a slower trickle now, but something still comes in most days. It's also been compounded by other things that I have done since. Now, while most of the hate that I get appears to come from Hindu nationalists specifically, I also do get hate from more general anti-Muslim groups. So for example, I've been targeted by Jihad Watch, which is a Muslim hate group based in the United States. They hate on Muslims and on everything that they connect with Islam, right? That, that's their whole thing. And among other things, they target professors, including me. Also, Note this picture of me in a Twitter parody account that was up for a long time of me, and I don't know if it's up anymore. This is a real picture of me, okay, over which they have put hijab. Now, there's nothing intrinsically offensive about hijab, right? It's a sartorial choice like, like any other, grounded in religious, cultural reasons, personal preference, whatever. But when I look at this, I understand that it's meant to be offensive. And I think when you all look at this too, you understand that it is intended to be offensive, right? And the, the reason why we all get that is because anti-Muslim sentiments pervade our society so deeply, right? Now, if the hate was just on social media, maybe I could just turn off Twitter and walk away, but it doesn't stay there. Sometimes I can't speak at all. In August of 2018, I was disinvited to speak in Hyderabad when the Bajrang Dal, which is a group somewhere between militants and common thugs, wrote to the Hyderabad police threatening violence if I were to take the stage. Now, one could argue that the Hyderabad police should have gone after the people threatening illegal violence, but instead they refused to provide protection. And in fact, they told me not to set foot inside, inside the city because I would not be safe. So I didn't. Ironically, my Hyderabad talk was titled Unpopular Stories. A little bit too unpopular, I guess. In this case, extreme nationalists, Hindu nationalists, succeeded in silencing me. I have still never given the lecture that I prepared for Hyderabad. There's also the threat of physical violence. And people do worry about my safety, both in India and even in the United States. In both countries, I have been known to have armed guards present when I present on certain topics and in certain venues. 
I want to underscore how incredible that is. That an academic speaking on literally ancient history requires armed protection. The most recent thing that I've faced is this, uh, a petition to get me fired. So this was not specifically about Aurangzeb. What happened was that in September of 2019, I spoke at a protest outside the United Nations. I spoke for about five minutes and I shared some textbook knowledge, right? Undisputed facts that basically everyone in the Indian history business knows about links between early Hindutva ideology and Nazism. Now, by the way, I mentioned this at every opportunity. Of course, uh, Hindutva ideologues were influenced and inspired by Nazis, real, actual Nazis. Hindu nationalists uh, did not appreciate my, my insights into their origins, and so they began this petition to get me fired from Rutgers. Now, the petition didn't work. Rutgers stood strong behind me. In fact, they granted me tenure last month. But this intimidation will still dissuade other scholars. And that's because nobody likes to be hated, nobody likes to be hit with smear campaigns, and nobody likes the stress associated with people trying to imperil your employment. So where does all of this lead us? Right? I had a section where I talked about sort of heavy scholarship about Aurangzeb, and then there's all this hate, right? How, how do the two sides come together? So one thing I want to emphasize is that this is not an equal fight. And it is not a debate in any sense, right? There is no debate. I do not debate with hate because there's no intellectual question at stake, right? I, I can't debate with, with people that, that hate and argue in bad faith. I can talk about Hindu nationalists and Hindu nationalism. I have a lot to say about them, but I have nothing to say to them. So while I'm over here talking about history, essentially my side wins at history, right? And I want to say that I am perceived as threatening by extreme nationalists in India and by Islamophobes across the world because my scholarship is good. And that's not to say that I am always right. No scholar is always right. No historian is always correct. But I make sound, good faith academic arguments. On the other side, the haters, right, they just yell and scream in an ever-increasing decibel level and with more and more filth. Now, these threats and intimidation sometimes work, although they have nothing to say directly about the actual content of my scholarship, right? We're essentially sort of talking past one another. Now, if there is a silver lining to this otherwise dismal state of affairs, I think it's this. Indians across a very broad spectrum really care about history, right? And that, that's a delight for a historian. Even the Hindu nationalists who are so upset about my Aurangzeb, even they still identify historical arguments as important and persuasive enough to muzzle. So the question for me is this, can historians turn some of that energy and interest into real historical curiosity? Right? Can I take people who might have heard about Aurangzeb the myth and get them interested in Aurangzeb the Mughal emperor? I think possibly I can. After all, I am speaking to you all today. But can it at all be inspirational? So I think that one thing that studying Mughal history and Aurangzeb can do, it can help us see that our categories aren't timeless. Right? Hinduism, Islam, orthodoxy, what it means to be Indian, all of those things change over time, and they are still changing all the time. Right? These are not fixed things. Through recognizing such change, perhaps we can find the unexpected and thereby be empowered to shape our future, to be better than our present and better than our past. So take Aurangzeb. Most likely, the Aurangzeb that I talked about today was not the one you grew up hearing about. I want a world with more of this, more history, right? Fewer communal sentiments. I want the India full of diversity on the map here, not the one flattened by saffron hate. And so even as modern day India descends deeper into being a Hindu Rashtra, I continue to research aspects of India's much deeper Indo-Muslim history that I hope can expand and enliven our imaginations today. 
Thank you to you all for listening. That is what I have to say about Aurangzeb Alamgir. I'm going to end this session and then we're going to start a new one with, uh, with Q&A. So please join me there in just a couple of moments.